Hi again, it's you. Come back for some more Macbeth. This time we're going to go through the play. I'm going to read Act 1, first of all, all the way through, all however many pages of it, so I don't know how long the video will last. At least you've got the, um, the, the tool of the pause button, should you need it. Now, like I recommend, you get your own copy of the text and you just follow along as I'm reading it. I'll try and do some different voices, but I'm not going to guarantee that. Um, so it'll be probably be best if you just follow on with your finger. I'm not going to say the names of the people as we're going. I'm just literally going to read the text for you to follow. All right, that's all I'm going to do. All right, you ready? You're sitting tight. You got to the first page, Act 1, Scene 1. Here we go. The battlefield, thunder and lightning, enter three witches. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burl is done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin, Paddock calls, anon. Fair is foul, and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. Act 1, Scene 2. The King's Headquarters, Alarum within, enter King Duncan, Malcolm, Donald Bain, Lennox, with attendants, meeting a bleeding captain. What bloody man is that? He can report, as seemeth by his plight of the revolt, the newest state. This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend, say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. Doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel for to that, the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles of Kearns and the Galaglasses is supplied, and fortune on his damned quarrel smiling showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution like valour's minion carved out his passage till he faced a slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him till he unseamed him from the knave to the chaps and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman! As whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, mark, no sooner justice had, with valour armed, compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord, surveying vantage, with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. Dismayed this, dismayed not this our captains, Macbeth and Banquo. Yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If I say sooth, I must report they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha. I cannot tell, but I am faint. My gashes cry for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds, this mark of honour both. Go get him, surgeons. Enter Ross and Angus. Who comes here? The worthy thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. <laughs> so should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Where comes thy worthy thane? From Fife, great king. 
where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold, Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the Thane of Cordor, began a dismal conflict till that Bologna's bride bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and, to conclude, the victory fell upon us. Great happiness! That now, Sweno, the Norway's king, craves composition, nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Colm's inch ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that thing of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. Scene 3. The Heath, Thunder, enter the three witches. Where hast thou been, sister? Killing swine. <laughs> sister, where thou? A sailor's wife had chestnuts in her lap, and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I. Aroint thee, witch, the rump-fed Runyon cries, her husband's to Aleppo gone, master of the tiger. But in a sieve I'll thither sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a wind, for thou'rt kind, and I another. I have myself have all the other, and the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know in the shipman's card, I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live a man for bid, wary senites nine times nine shall he dwindle, peak and pine. Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be tempest-tossed. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb, wrecked as homeward he did come. Drum within. A drum, a drum, Macbeth doth come. The weird sisters, hand in hand, posters of the sea and land, thus do go about, about, thrice to thine, and thrice to mine, and thrice again to make up nine. Peace, the charms wound up. Enter Macbeth and Banquo. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is it to forest? What are these so withered and so wild in their attire, that look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are on it. Live ye, or are ye out, that man may question. Ye seem to understand me, by each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. Ye should be women, and yet your beards forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if ye can, what are ye? All oh, hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. Oh, 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 hail, Macbeth, hail to thee, Thane of Cordor. All oh, hail, Macbeth, thou shalt be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are ye fantastical, or that indeed, which outwardly ye show? My noble partner, ye greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me ye speak not. If ye can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favours nor your hate. Hail! 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 Lesser than Macbeth, but greater. Not so happy, yet much happier. Thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So all hail, Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. 
Tell me more by Fennel's death. I know I am the Thane of Glamis, but how of Cawdor? The Thane of Cawdor lives a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not within the prospect of belief. No more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, or oh, why upon this blasted heath ye stop our way with such prophetic greeting. Speak, I charge ye. Which is? The earth hath bubbles, as the water has. Ah, these are them. Whither are they vanished? Into the air, and what seemed corporal, melted as breath into the wind, would they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we eaten on the insane route that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. Ye shall be king. And Thane of Cawdor too went not so. To the self same tune and words. Who's here? Enter Ross and Angus. The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success, and when he reads thy personal venture in the rebel sight, his wonders and his praises do contend which should be thine or his. Silenced with that, in viewing all the rest of the selfsame day, he finds thee in the stout Norwegian ranks. Nothing afeard of what thyself didst make, strange images of death. As thick as tail came post with post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defence, and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight not pay thee, and for an earnest of a greater honour, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which addition, hail, most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can't the devil speak be true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? He has the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or with that with both he laboured in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Glamis and Thane of Cordor, the greatest is behind. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings, when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promised them no less? That trusted home might yet enkindle you unto the crown, besides the Thane of Cawdor, but tis strange and oftentimes to win us to our harm. The instruments of darkness tell us truths, Win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word I pray you. Two truths are told, as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me earnest of success, commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, shakes so my single state of man that function is smothered in surmise and nothing is but what is not. Look, look how our partners wrapped. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir? New honours come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mould but with the aid of use. Come what may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favour, my dull brain was wrought with things forgotten, Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. 
think upon what hath chanced, and that more time, the interim having weighed it, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Ay, very gladly. Till then enough. Come, friends. Scene 4. The King's Headquarters. Flourish. Enter King Duncan, Lennox, Malcolm, Donald Blaine, and attendants. Is execution done on Cordor, or not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back, but I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed as to a careless trifle. There's no art to find a man mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Enter Macbeth, Banquo, Ross and Angus. Oh, worthiest cousin, the sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine, only I have left to say more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe, in doing it pays itself. Your highness part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state, children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honour. Welcome, Heather. I have begun to plant thee, and will labour to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo, thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known, no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee, and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, <laughs> seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, fiends, and those you whose places are the nearest know, we will establish our stay upon our eldest Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honour must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. From hence to Inverness, and bind us further to ye. The rest is labour which is not used for ye. I'll be making the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach, so I'll humbly take my leave. My worthy Cordo. The Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down, or else or a leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. True worthy Banquo, he is full so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed, it is a banquet to me. Let's after him, whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. Scene 5. Inverness. Macbeth's castle. Enter Lady Macbeth, alone with a letter. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report that they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question him further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it, came missives from the king. He all hailed me, Thane of Coddo, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with, Hail, king, shall, shall be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that though that thou must not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glamis thou art, and Cordor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou wouldst be 
great art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false and yet wouldst wrongly win. Thou'dst have great glamis, that which cries, thus mount thou must do, if thou have it, and that which rather thou thou dost fear to do than wishest should be undone. Hide thee hither, that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, and chastise with the valour of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. Enter attendant. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him? He, wert so, would have informed for my preparation. So please you, it is true. Our thane is coming. One of our my fellows had the speed of him, who almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than we would make up this message. Give him tending, he brings great news. Exit. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, ye spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the axis and passage to remorse, that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, ye murder murdering ministers. Wherever you are in the sightless substances, you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold, hold, enter Macbeth. Great Glamis, worthy Godo, greater than both by the all hail thereafter, thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he proposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye. Your hand, your tongue, look like the innocent flower. But be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and ye shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We, we will speak further. Only look up clear to alter favour ever is fear. Leave all the rest to me. Scene 6. Inverness, approaching Macbeth's castle. Hope boys and torches, enter King Duncan, Malcolm, Donald Bain, Banquay, Lennox, Macduff, Ross, Angus, and attendants. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. The guest of summer, the temple-haunting mantlet, doth approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty, frieze, buttress, nor coin of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle, where they must breed and haunt. I have observed the air is delicate. Enter Lady Macbeth. See, see our honoured hostess, the love that followed us sometime is our trouble, which still we thank as love. Herein I teach ye. How ye shall bid God yield us for your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point twice done and then done double, were poor and single business to contend against those honours deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house. For those of old and the late dignities heaped up to them, we rest your hermits. Where's the thing of Cordo? We cost him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well, and his great love, sharper as his spur, hath help him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. 
your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in kind to make their order at your highness pleasure still to return your own give me your hand conduct me to mine host we love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him by your leave hostess scene seven inside macbeth's castle enter a sewer and diverse servants with dishes and service all over the stage. Then enter Macbeth. If it were done when tis done, then twere well if it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his succeed success that but this blow might be the be-all and the end-all, here but here upon this bank and shoal of time we'd jump the life to come. But in these cases we still have judgment here that we but teach bloody instructions which being taught return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poisoned chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subjects throng both against the deed, then as his host who should against his murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne that his faculties so meek hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off, and pity like a naked newborn babe stride in the blast o'er heaven's cherubin host upon the sightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind i have no spur to prick the sides of my intent but only vaulting ambition which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other enter lady macbeth hi hey, nay what knees he has almost supped why have you left the chamber? H hath he asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in the newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. What's the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art they afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemed the ornament of life and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor cat in the dage? Pray thee, peace, I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man, and to be more than you were, you would be so much more than the man. Nor time nor place did then I dare, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and you know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out had us or sworn, as you have done to this. And if we should fail, we fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and with ale so convince that memory the water of the brain shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a limbic only. When in swinish sleep their drenched natures lies as in a death, what cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy offices? He shall, he shall bear the guilt of our great quell. Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and used their very daggers that they have done it? Who dares receive it at the other as we shall make our griefs and clamour roar upon his death? I'm settled and bend up, each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away, mock the time with fairest show, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. End of Act 1. Okay, well, 
that was all right. I tried, hopefully you followed along with your finger. It's a bit tricky with the voices. And also, gosh, no matter how many times I practice reading those words, whew, some of them are tongue twisters. But again, I hope it helped. Tomorrow, because I'm starting to get a little bit dark now, look. Tomorrow I'll do act two and put it up on the old YouTube. All right, okay, hopefully it helped. If you haven't looked at the introduction and the short story and the synopsis yet, I really suggest you go back to the top of this playlist and have a look at them, particularly the short story. The short story is Macbeth in a nutshell, basically, and it's really easy to understand. So listen to the short story before you listen and follow the play. Okay. Exeunt.